think let's get let's get cracker lacking. Um, obviously, uh, the, these talks are things that Swen has been uh, running um, kind of sporadically. They've been incredibly helpful. Um, just chatting about leadership, um, trying to bring value to you guys in, a, in in kind of any setting, any atmosphere, workplace, church. Um, and tonight is is no different. Um, I have stumbled. I've been kind of watching and going through leadership material for the last five or six years. Um, sporadically, and I've stumbled on some really good stuff. I've stumbled on some really bad stuff. Um, but tonight, I want to share um, almost notes and learnings that I've learned from a pretty recent podcast. Essentially, we're going to be looking at eight habits that great leaders have in common. So what I won't be claiming is that um, these all, all these eight habits are habits that I've got down or that Swen's got down or that all of you guys have got down. But what we'd like to do and what I would like to do tonight is have a conversation around these eight habits, um, share them with you briefly, talk about them. And if there is potentially one or two or, you know, maybe we're reaching for the stars here, maybe even three of these habits that you're like, you know what, these are these are potential growth areas for me. These are things that I could work on or I think could add to my leadership. Um, then I think tonight would have been um, a big success. I acknowledge where we are in the year as well um, in terms of growth and personal investment coming around October, November. Normally not great times for that because everybody's just trying to keep head above water. So appreciate you guys joining tonight. I hope that it, it will be helpful um, and that it can add some value to you guys and, and, and what you're up to. So we're looking at eight habits. So if you've got anything to take a note down with, if there's a phone or if there's just something close to you, you can take a note down with any thoughts that jump out to you, um, the habit itself jumps out to you. Cause then what I would like to do is uh, break up. Um, it's not, there's not loads of people on tonight, but we can maybe break up into two or three breakout rooms, have a brief discussion about a habit or two that really stuck out to us. That are, that's a potential growth area. Um, and then we can land it there. Will we need the full hour tonight? You know what? If you're well behaved, if you're well behaved, maybe I just cut this thing 15 minutes short. Let me just, you know what? Living on the edge here. Yeah? Don't tell Swin. If you tell Swin, then literally I will be in trouble. But um, there's Champions League and football and stuff on tonight. So come on. Let's hit this thing. 45 minutes. Let's smash it. Eight habits that great leaders have in common. So I just want to share a few thoughts with you guys. Please take things in. Don't take things in. Have a note where you can. Um, the best leaders aren't always the smartest. They aren't always the hardest working or the best connected people. The best leaders intentionally commit to strategic habits that produce the desired results. That is essentially kind of the, the thesis statement that we want to come around here. No one becomes the greatest leader overnight. It is normally uh, years of investment, growth, adding, trying new things, and keyword failing failing hard, failing over and over again, and then we start to learn. So the first habit I want to look at with you guys is the habit of no snooze. The habit of no snooze. And the question that I'll pose for you is how do you get out of bed each morning? There are three categories that, that each of you probably fall into. The first one, do you wake up naturally, you know, with no alarm? Just natural wake up, ready to attack the day. Second category, do you get up? after your first alarm. So let's say you've got an alarm, it goes off 5.30 a.m., you get up, you're done, you're ready to attack. Or there's the third category. Uh, you wake up to your alarm, then you hit snooze, you wake up again, you hit snooze again, so on and so forth. According to a study done by the University of uh, Notre Dame, 57% of people fit into that third category of having the snooze button readily available and clicking it at our earliest convenience. Just a few thoughts around this. The cycle of hitting snooze can cause a chemical and psychological cascade of torment. Some big words here. Um, the adrenaline that races through your body every time your alarm goes off gets triggered. This jarring experience every morning can have negative effects on your health and can even lead to heart problems. So allowing the alarm to go off and on, off and on, off and on, and not attacking your day can have some health issues or health effects. When you wake up at the right time with your alarm or without it, you're telling yourself that the first part of your day matters. Start early. And if you can't start early, start strong. So the first habit we want to talk about or the first habit that we're landing on here is how do we start our days? Are we starting our days in a way that is productive? Are we starting our days in a way that... Uh, is telling our minds, telling our bodies, telling our hearts that we're ready to attack what needs to attack. Now, there are going to be people that are 
morning people, there are people that are evening people, people that are really strong and can start days. So for me, I'm quite, you know, I'm not very strong in the mornings, but I have started the process of setting an alarm and actually waking up at that alarm time quickly without shaming anybody. Does anybody want to say what their morning routine or morning system looks like and whether they fall into one of those categories? 6.15, alarm goes off and I'm out of bed. And it's easy? Easy. Love that. I try to get a coffee and then I go and read something and then I'm already then getting dressed by before 6 30 and off I go. Can I ask another question? Every morning. What does your yep. night before routine look like? Do you go to sleep at the same time every night? Yes. Okay. So 10, 10 o'clock is my like off and then I'm into bed and then I try and wind down and then usually by 10 15 or 10 30 latest, I'm out. Lights out. Excellent. Love that. Anybody else want to shame the devil? Share the truth. Shame the devil. I don't mind sharing. Um, I think it depends on how my nighttime looks. Like, I'll be honest. Like, if I go to bed at the right time, I wake up and I'm ready for the day. But if I, like, stay up too late, then I will snooze my alarm. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's true for most of us. The The evening routine is, is incredibly important. Anybody else? Nods? Hit us. <clears throat> I always snooze my alarm, <laughs> but I always leave the house like uh, later at 5 a.m. because I go to the gym from Monday to Friday, and Ooh. then I start my day. That's excellent. I love that. I started, I started newly, so, but I'm doing it. Well done. Well done, Nadia. Keep that up. In essence, what I want to highlight here is, is routine. Um, having a morning routine that can set you up, set your day up. Um, obviously, as a church and as church leaders, we'd love to encourage having some sort of devotional time, devotional moment in the morning that is regular, that is timed, that has a moment, that has a space, um, and that's something that you get to every day. But kind of the point of this habit is highlighting the fact that there's no single perfect morning routine, but having routine has got study show, has drastic effects to how we handle our days and how we do our meetings, how we interact, even how we arrive to work or wherever our workspace may be. So a great habit here is having a morning routine. For me, this is a serious challenge because Jean-Marie and I both, I think, enjoy the snooze button a little bit too much. And then we're not really good for each other in those moments and in that space. Um, but recently and, and for the last few months, having a time where I would get up, uh, engage with God, think about my day, even think about other things, I felt like I was having a brand new day. So morning routine, think about a morning routine. Craig Rochelle says it like this, start early, and if you can't start early, start strong. So it's not about having the 5.30 a.m., but have some sort of routine, something to get into. Again, we're talking about habits that, that great leaders have in common. Routine. Morning routine is incredibly helpful. Have a look at your routine. Have a look at how your morning is starting. Maybe there's places for adjustments to take small steps. Happiness? Excellent. Actually, I just wanted to I, I add something on KFM Monday Motivation um, on Monday. And the guy spoke about making your bed um, every morning. So when you wake up, you make your bed, and then you've already accomplished something for the day. That's your first accomplishment for the day. It's getting up, making your bed. Uh, not like getting up, leaving it, and doing this, doing that. Make your bed, and then you've already accomplished something for, for the rest of the day. That's yeah. very well, funny, Evan. Five minutes ago, I put into the chat that exact speech. It's, it's, oh, did you? Oh, okay. It changed. It was something I saw years ago, and it's changed yeah. my perspective of, how do I say, prioritization of things. And basically, it's a speech by this Admiral William McRaven. Mm -hmm. It's a really good speech. It's really worth listening to, but speaks yeah, to that okay. exact point. If you do the little things right, it makes the big things possible. And he's basically, his entire speech is make your bed. Very good. Very worthwhile watching. It's an excellent speech. Maybe a hero, an absolute hero, can pop the link in the chat. Ready um, five minutes ago, but flip. Why? <laughs> you guys should be giving this talk to the rest of our church because you guys are killing it. Okay, so our first habit: routine, morning routine, starting strong, getting small victories early can lead to bigger victories during the day. Second habit, and and I found this really interesting and something that I don't think about a lot. Um, and, and maybe it can spark some thoughts of conversation for us as well. It's called the habit of pre-deciding, pre-deciding. So basically the write-up is the basic principle of this habit of pre-deciding is this. Anytime you can make a decision ahead of time, make it. And anytime you can automate a decision, 
automate it. And then it moves on to speaking about decision fatigue, which is something that a lot of us are going to experience, especially this time of the year. The more decisions you make in a day, the lower the quality of your decision making ability. So as others, or so as often as possible, make a decision ahead of time. You will accomplish so much more as a leader when you pre-decide to prioritize what matters most. How do we how do we prioritize what matters most? For me, the thing that has changed the game when it comes to, to the, the habit of pre-deciding or creating that is actually having a space where I can shut off or close off the things that usually take my attention, usually take decision-making power, usually take choices that lead to decision fatigue. Actually scheduling a time in my day, if it's an hour or two hours, to the things that are really, really important, to the things that I cannot afford to allow decision fatigue to come in and to really influence the way that I make those decisions. So I have to make time in my week to think about key people, key leaders that I work with and that I love and that I care about and that I want the best for. I have to make time for sermon prep. Um, I have to make time for sermon research because I cannot let, and it's very easy to let other things, and I'm just speaking from a ministry context, all of you guys are going to have a different context and a, a different things that take time. But from my perspective in a ministry context, there are many things that can come in and take and take away, but I actually can't allow for decision fatigue or, or for those types of things to influence the things that really matter to me. And that's leading people well. And also when I'm preaching, preparing sermons well. So Craig Rochelle says, anytime you can make a decision ahead of time, anytime you can think of something ahead of time, make it. I find that an intriguing statement because actually at first it can be a bit confusing. How do some of you interpret that? Anytime you can make a decision ahead of time, make it how does one make a decision ahead of time when when we're not even aware of potentially what the question may be anybody want to have a crack i've, I've posed the tension straight afterwards there but there, there there are there are thoughts and answers to it anytime you can make a decision ahead of time make it how would we do that uh for, okay. mm. i guess if you know you've got a meeting that you need to attend uh yeah prep for that have an agenda in your head uh, yeah. and then just say, okay, this is what I want to get out of it. This is what I need to do. And if someone says this, shoot him down. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think that's where I would. Excellent. Excellent. Exactly right. When we have an idea, when we've got a rough plan of what a day, a successful day or a day where at the beginning of it, we're like, if it can look like this, I would love that. If this can get done, this can get done, this can get done, and it can get done in this way. If we have that plan, if we have that bit of thought, if we have that bit of preparation, then we're able to pre-decide. Then we're able to say, okay, this is important, this isn't. These are worth thinking and thought power. These things are not worth thinking and thought power. Do we want margin in our lives? Of course we do. Because sometimes things happen, things pop up. We've got to, we've got to uh, be present in certain situations when necessary. But the habit of pre-deciding and making decisions beforehand, why? To limit the effects of decision fatigue, to limit the effects of allowing our choices on our decision making to slowly diminish because we no longer have the energy to give it the thinking power that it deserves so to plan and to prep as best we can and this can go across the board this can be your working day maybe it could be a sunday if you if you if you are involved in leadership in some way thinking about the team thinking about the morning okay what do we want to get done quinton's thinking about production he's thinking about setup he's thinking about run through he's thinking about the service itself he's thinking about set down he's thinking about the personnel he's thinking about the people that are normally problem people he's thinking about the people that normally come late he's thinking about the people that uh, are excellent and he wants to praise them there's so much and sometimes we can allow ourselves to fall into mornings fall into days and again thinking about a bit of prep it's leaning from it's leaning from the morning routine. Again, we're leaning into preparation, pre-deciding things before it happens. Anybody else have a thoughts on this before we crack on? I mean, all I would say is what I've got into a habit of doing specifically this year is and this obviously a work very much a work perspective thing is blocking time to, to intentionally think yeah. about stuff. Very good. Intentionally like block time to consider my week, consider my business plan for the year and kind of reviewing that every like, and actually really like making these key times for it. And it took a bit of time in the beginning to get right, but the habit of it and being sacred about that time meant that I wasn't just running from one thing to the next. I was actually being pre-considered about what I was doing. Very good. 
Very good. Planning and dreaming time. It almost sounds a bit airy fairy uh, to certain personalities and to my personality, it, it, it really does, but it's something I'm needing to grow in. Um, you know, blocking an hour aside to actually think vision and to think big picture, which is, which is so leadership orientated. Like if you're wanting to grow in your leadership, I can tell all of you right now, but if you're wanting to grow in your leadership, being able to think big picture, thinking past right now, thinking past the next service or the next day at work or the next meeting and, and having vision for the month, vision for the year, what, what the next five years can look like. That's what leaders do. Leaders see beyond what's in front of them right now and is able to make decisions today that impact the tomorrow, that impact the next five years. And I believe getting these things of preparation down lends into that instead of becoming so busy and caught up in the day-to-day, -day, getting things done, keeping head above water. Kev, you've got your hand up. Was that an accident or you wanted to say something? Oh yeah, I'm mute, mate. Kev. Oh, mute there, Kev. Come on, man. <laughs> You're muted, Kev. Come on, boy. Push my space bar on, you know, tells me. One time. <laughs> Let's start again. Can't you guys look read? <laughs> uh, so, Kyle was talking about business plans, and I've been through the corporate world, and I've been through a million business plans, and one of the most common things is that often we, we do all these business plans, we meet every quarter, and then we don't revisit the business plan. Yeah, we don't check on it often enough. You know, you go to the next meeting, next quarter, and you start with a business plan again, and you don't. It's you've got to stick to and check on what you've planned and, and plan to alter as well. Yeah. There's a very good book. I don't know if everybody's read it called Who Moved My Cheese. Mm. So it's, it's a very it's a short, short little book. It's, it's a cookbook, eh? Not quite. <laughs> It's just about being adaptable because yes. things always move and change. Good. Yeah, maybe pop that name down in the in the in the or somebody can pop it down. He's active in the chat there. Who moved my cheese? I've heard of that book. I was just I was just joking with you. I've heard of it. I haven't read it yet. Um, that sounds excellent. Thanks, Kev. Um, let Let's shift on. This is potentially the habit that I that I like the most um, because it's 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 the most challenging. Uh, for me especially. So we've looked at two habits already. The first one is the habit of no snooze. We've looked at the habit of pre-deciding and leaning into prep um, and, and planning and being able to make decisions beforehand. Third habit we're looking at is the habit of doing the hard right. So we're hyphenating hard right there, the habit of doing the hard right. In your leadership, you're always going to face challenges and obstacles. That's not new to anybody here. When you face these challenges, you'll always have two options, okay? You're gonna have the easy wrong or you're gonna have the hard right. You're gonna have the easy wrong or you're gonna have the hard right and you'll always be tempted to take the easy way out. Don't. Many leaders ask what's easy, the best leaders ask what's right. Now this should already begin to uh, resonate with you, especially again, I actually think it's so timely that we're doing this chat now at this point of the year. There are so many moments when I know what the right thing is to do, but I couldn't be bothered because I'm tired, because I'm frustrated, because it's a situation that is continually recurring and it's just not getting handled and I'm annoyed and nothing's working. The best leaders the best leaders are always asking the question, what is the right thing to do? I think this is so prevalent for where we are right now, especially as church leaders and leading people in a church context and in your work context as a Christian. The question we should be asking continually is what is the right, what is the right answer? Um, many leaders avoid the hard right because it will make a difficult situation even more difficult in the short term. <laughs> like that's not encouraging. That, that doesn't sound like something, okay, great, let me do that. And that is sometimes the case. Sometimes the right thing to do, if somebody is, we can, we can give it like a hypothetical situation. If somebody is, is, is struggling with something, maybe they're carrying the wrong culture on your team, you know, the, the wrong, there's a wrong way to handle that and there's a right way. The right way would to take that person on a journey of understanding culture. That might require meetups. That might require corrections. That might require further conversations down the line in order for the person to understand and to grow and to learn. The easy wrong could just be to ignore it. The easy wrong could just, well, you know what, I'm tired. It's not that bad. 
it's, is it really going to affect anybody kind of sweep it under the rug but as soon as one person brings bad culture it gives permission to everybody in the team in the group um, for the culture to change and one bad apple really does affect um, the rest of them so, so the hard right is you know what i've got to address this we've got to do something about it we've got to change it and that's the thing with leadership and something that i've seen in church for so often if you do not set the tone as the leader somebody else will and that's that's just how it works in church uh in teams with people if you do not set the tone so i'm not saying hey we've all got to come in there we're dictators it's our way of the highway no 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 i'm a very collaborative person I, I love working with people chatting to people and speaking to people but but if i can sense that the culture is moving and shifting and going away and i'm using culture as an example in this context of habits of of doing the hard right if i can sense that is shifting the responsibility is on me to address that and to bring that forward so you guys that are listening here tonight you might not be the leader of your ministry but you can make it completely you can make a huge difference and adding incredible value by understanding okay there's a there is a wrong easy way and there might be a hard right way. Let's lean towards the hard right. Let's lean towards the thing that's actually going to solve the problem, even if it requires something more of me. Now, you don't have to do that, but these are habits that great leaders have in common. So you can you can list it and you can level it and you can do things how you wish to do it. Great leaders choose the hard right over the easy wrong. We aren't working towards what makes tomorrow easier. We're working, we're working towards what makes our team better. Another thought is apply the habit of the hard right to every area of your life. Now that's excellent. Every area of your life, apologize, confess sin, take the long way, invest, instruct, forgive, even when you don't have to. Now, what does that sound like? Sounds a bit like Christianity. <laughs> Sounds a bit like what it means to be a believer. And if somebody, you know, what does the scripture say? If somebody takes your shirt, give them your jacket. Somebody slaps your cheek, give them the other cheek. I mean, geez, challenging, so against earthly culture and human culture, but that's what it is be a believer. I think for us, again, as leaders, to be reminded yet again, I'm not looking for the easy, I'm not looking for the quick, I'm looking for the right, even when it's hard, even when it makes the situation harder. If I know in my heart, and the people that are around me and my advisors and the people in my life also believe that it's the right way to do it. We're going to go through the problem, not around it. And we're not going to find the easy way out. Another quote here from Craig Rochelle um, that I'll end this habit with is, you'll never ever regret doing what's right, but you'll often regret doing what's easy. And I think we've experienced that um, in our lives. You'll never regret doing the right thing, ever. No matter how long it takes, how quick, you'll never regret. But sometimes taking the easy way out becomes a problem later on. So the habit of doing the hard right, seeking it out, understanding it, identifying it, and going for it every time. Um, I'm gonna jump over to habit number four, and then we'll have a quick kind of uh, chat, and then, we will, then we'll try to wrap up with the last four habits. So the habit number four is also very good. Um, it's the habit of you first leadership. You first leadership, we're hyphenating you first. So the natural trajectory of leadership is towards self. And that, that is the tension for all leaders. The natural trajectory of leadership is towards self. You, you speak first and you speak last in meetings. You get the credit when things are going well. And sometimes you shift the blame when things are going badly. We could all be guilty um, of this. These, these are all things that naturally we can we can struggle with and have tensions with. And as you rise in influence, the habit of you first leadership will help you intentionally fight this inclination, intentionally fight the inclination to make it about you, to make the leadership about you, where you bring your position, your power, your value, because really it's about the people you lead. Simon Sinek teaches this, the leaders who get the most out of their people are those who care the most out of their people. You first leadership and the habit of you first leadership is actually about how we can care and look after the people we lead, making it less about us as the leader. It really matters that you actually care about people. And that care has to start in your heart before your people will feel it in the office or in the church. Now, this is where it gets tricky because now we're saying, okay, we've actually got to genuinely care about people. We've got to love people in our hearts. Uh, the first question that probably comes to mind is what if you don't like the people in your team? What if you don't like the people in your office? What if you don't like the people uh, in your church? Well, there's two possible situations here. Firstly, you could have the wrong people. So unless you inherited your team, 
This is the issue with having the wrong people. Unless you inherited your team, your team is a combination of what you've created or of what you've tolerated. So again, I mentioned culture um, a little bit earlier. The team that you've got, if you don't like your team, you don't gel with your team, you don't connect with your team, hey, you're very responsible for the condition of your team. It's either something you've put in place or it's something that you've tolerated. Again, it leans into if there's if there's something we addressed in our culture that we don't actually pull towards the hard right, something that is difficult, we allow a culture to grow and the dynamic of the team can change, still your responsibility, even if it sucks. And the number two of these situations, if you don't like your team, you have the right people, but you haven't led them well. So you might have a capable team, but you haven't led them to fit the culture, have a strong work ethic, or have passion for the mission. Both of these situations are on you. So you could have the wrong people, but that is also your responsibility, or you might have the right people, but you haven't led them well, also your responsibility. So what you wanna do is you don't have to like somebody to care about them. You can love and respect someone without liking them. If you wanna start living with the habit of you first leadership, start every interaction with the other person in mind. Again, this habit is about drawing away from us the leader, us the individual, and helping us focus on the people that we lead, practical ways of doing that. Are we thinking about our team? Are we thinking about the people we're doing ministry with? Are we thinking about the people in our workspace, in our office? Or is everything about you, the leader? For me, it's like, am I even thinking about the church when I arrive on a Sunday and I wave and I shake some hands and I kiss some babies and I get up to preach? Or is it just about what can Phil bring today? What, what word from God can Phil bless the people? I can tell you, I can tell you immediately that is the beginning of the end. And there was a moment where, where preaching was like that, where it's like, okay, I've got to, and you, and, and it's not even, it wasn't even from a bad place. It's like, I want to bless the church. I want to help the church. What's happening? I promise you, my preaching drastically improved when I took time to think about the church. Where are the people at? How are the people going to receive a message right now? What is, what, what's troubling them? What's on their heart? What's happening in the world? How are people coming to church today? Same for your teams. Maybe it's been back-to-back -back conferences and weekends and, and long nights and, and nights away from the family and setting up. And then I come in there and be like, guys, we've just got to love God. We've just got to build or you're a heathen. Um, that's a, it's, a crazy, it's a crazy way to think, but you can fall into that habit if the focus is always on you. What am I building? What am I bringing? How is my energy? We've actually got to take a step back. You first, leadership, the habit is actually you know the people first. Where are the people at? How can I care about the people? Do the people need more grace and mercy today? Or do the people need a challenge? Because both are fine. Both are fine. People need inspiration and motivation some days and to be called to something more. But sometimes people need grace and they need mercy. And it's been a long week or a long year and people have gone through a lot. As the leader, we need to be susceptible. And why one of the kind of the great gifts, spiritual gifts that I think all leadership should, should kind of at least develop or grow into is discernment. Are you able to discern where people are at when you're having conversations with them? Or are you offending people left, right, and center because you're the big bad leader who needs to get things done, but we're not able to kind of connect and find out where people are at, love people where they're at, take time to find common ground and to love leadership. And, and, and you being a great leader is going to come down a lot to your ability to connect and care and love for the people that you're leading. It could be three people. And if it's a bigger group, 50 or 100 or 150, have you put structure in place to understand where the people are at? Are there people that are connecting with the people you're not connecting with? You might be connecting with five. Are those five connecting with 10? Are those 10 connecting with the other 10? Are those other 10 connecting with the other 20? Are people being cared for, pastored, shepherded, and loved? The habit here is simple. To be an effective leader, are we focusing on the people? Are the people of focus? Are we caring and loving the people? Does that make sense? Any thoughts before we jump onto habit number five, six, seven, and eight? Then we have a quick chat. Nope, we're good, Russell. Good, 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 good. This is taking a bit longer. I'm going to talk uh, late. I just want to mention something on the habit of you first leadership. I think it's a it's a fantastic habit to have, um, but I think at times we we almost need to be like almost ruthless, you know, in, in dealing with issues and things like that that we potentially have in our teams. It's it's one thing to you know, leave things and let it just fester or whatever. But then on the other side, it can be easy for us as leaders to get into a space where we can be like, hey, we are talking about this, we are addressing this, but things never really change. Um, mm -hmm. 
and then you know in the moment it might seem like it's okay but you know in down the line in the future that's when that particular issue or whatever could create it again and be like 100 times worse than it was before you know just because of the fact that potentially we weren't like ruthless enough to like you know cut the thing off at the source like whatever it is whether it's a bad habit or bad attitude or whatever the case may be and i've seen that in our lives as well um yeah. being part of teams where or like you know I, I could almost call it like bad culture bad attitudes and things like that things were spoken about and blessed um but then only further down the line you know it becomes worse for the people who are left in in, in those kind of teams having to deal with it so i think it, it is situational but at times when when it is necessary to be kind of hit on with with issues uh we, we need to do that as well because yeah. of the fact that you know we have the team's best interest at heart it, it would almost be a disservice to the team if we are not ruthless you know to yeah. sort out things that needs to be sorted out so yeah yeah yeah, fully agree. Thanks, Hadley. Yeah, I think there's got to be there's got to be some things in our in our leadership that are non-negotiables, um, and often that's culture. Often it's it's culture points. It's whether people are in the culture or not in the culture. And then I think where the you first leadership might be helpful to people are people who maybe struggle to see past their own perspective, struggle to see past what what their task is, what they need to do as the leader, and to understand that these people, you know, also have lives and things happen and things change and kids get sick and 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 there's and there's more to it than what you're building and this is this is a massive challenge for me personally um because i'm like this flip this thing needs to happen like we're building this thing like people have got to be aware of the people like why are the guys not doing this and it's often jean marie who's like full geez dude like not everybody people like dig this and they want to build this but sometimes life happens so it's it's like the balance of it but i completely agree with what you're saying in terms of there's got to be some non-negotiables in your leadership that that if they affect the culture or if there's a problem that's going to that's just going to escalate over time it's almost like leading into one of those earlier habits that said have the hard have the hard choice now do the hard choice now even if it creates more work um, because that's going to bless you in the long run the easy wrong choice now might be easier now and, and pushes it under the carpet but it becomes a problem later on um, so fully agree with you there any other thoughts Okay, so just to run through um, our last kind of four habits, again, a lot of these are quite um, uh, philosophical and they're trying to just get you thinking in lines of um, maybe different different ways of approaching situations. Uh, so the fifth habit here is the habit of touching the line, the habit of touching the line. Um, and the interesting analogy here is, and maybe some of you can remember uh, probably in high school, um, when playing sports or doing fitness drills or doing the bleep test, it, it was always about touching the line. You have to get back, touch the line, run, touch the line. Or when they would set out kind of the the three kilometer or the five kilometer course around the field, and there would be the there would be the cones around the field, and you had to run around the cone. You can't cut the corner. Run around the cone, so you're doing the full um, distance. And the habit here is basically just around leadership: is don't stop when you're tired. Stop when you're done. Stop when the task is done. Stop when what you've set out to do has been accomplished. Always, always, always touch the line in your leadership and in the goals that you set. And I find this so important, especially in goal setting, when we're talking to our teams and we're talking about events and we're talking about things that we're planning to do. Nothing breaks trust with people than us sharing a great vision or sharing a great plan and then never actually accomplishing and never actually achieving what we've set out to do. Now, again, life happens, things don't always go to plan, especially when we set up maybe big goals or big dreams or big aspirations. We wanna see a thousand people at Christmas. It's like, okay, cool, like let's gun for that. Maybe 600 people come, that's still a win. It's more along the lines of, are we going to keep working towards things when things get difficult? Or are we gonna keep touching the line? And, and you all know, and this is gonna be, this is gonna be very contextual uh, for you guys as well. You all know the moments in your life where you are cutting the corner. You'll know the moments in your life where you, you should be touching the line, but you've actually you pulled away two meters quicker uh, because it's, you're tired and things are getting heavy and there's circumstances and everybody's against you. The habit is simple. It's can we continue to touch the line? Can we con continue to do the things that we've set out to do? Um, and I think this even pulls back to the alarm setting in the morning. You're setting an alarm at 630 to wake up. What do you tell your brain? What do you tell your body when you set the alarm, but you're just going to snooze anyway? You're just going to snooze it anyway. 
again, it's the same message you tell your team. You set a goal, but immediately the people that have been under you for a while, they're like, okay, that's a great goal. We haven't really gone for the last three that we set. We haven't achieved the last three that we set. I don't know if I'm ready to get excited. I don't know if I'm ready to, to charge the mountain with you because we actually haven't done this. I think a lot of that is less about talent and capability. I think it's this habit of touching the line. You know, we're going to keep working. Even when we're tired, even when we're struggling, we're going to keep touching the line. We're going to not cut corners. We're going to keep moving. We're not going to stop when we're tired. We're going to stop when we're done. Clarity, habit number six. Um, and again, this kind of leans a little bit into um, the previous habit. This habit is the habit of one more rep. One more rep. So immediately we can go into, we can think about a gym setting here. To become a world-class leader, do more than what is expected of you. Simple, simple statement, powerful. To become a world-class leader, do more than what is expected. If you want to be successful in the gym, there's power in doing one more rep. If you set out to do 10 reps, do 11. What you do, you're doing 10% more than expected. So why is this important? To exceed the expectations of others, you have to raise the expectations for yourself. What do we love in our teams, guys? When somebody shows initiative, when somebody does something that is beyond expectation, they're normally, hey, you just need to come at 8.30, make sure the urn is on, uh, make sure the tea is stacked, and then we're ready to receive people. What blows our minds? Someone who comes at 7.30. They set up the table, they put the tablecloth on, they're spraying spritz in the air so that it smells nice and not stinky and not like a school when people arrive. That that beyond expectation for us, those are the types of people that we're saying, you know, there's potentially a leader here. There's potentially someone who's who's beyond expectation, who's not just here to tick a box or to pass the time. They're here to, to move things forward. Now, the challenge is, if that's what we look for in people and we look for in team, are we as leaders breaking the mold of expectation? Are we, are we doing what is expected of a leader or are we going for that 11th rep? Are we going for, we wanna do one more, we wanna go harder, we wanna go further. And this isn't just about come earlier, leave later, because that can be quite a, um, it can become unhealthy in terms of you know time of family, so on and so forth, but it can be about, are we exceeding expectation as leaders? Some other thoughts here, whenever someone asks you to do something, give them more than what they ask for. Again, it's simple, but it's effective for leadership. It's a practice that benefits them and it helps you stand out in their mind. The same logic applies to companies. When an employee of a company goes above and beyond for you, it changes how you view the entire company that they work for. It, it's, it's like an ambassador. Somebody from a company comes and does something exceptional. You're like, geez, that, automa that has to be a great company. They have to be teaching and mo modeling and the leadership must be excellent there because you have someone who goes over and above. You not only will think well of the company, you become an ambassador. So what does this mean for the people you lead? Someone who meets expectation, and this is an excellent thought, someone who meets expectation is someone worth keeping. Someone who exceeds expectation is someone worth promoting. Someone who meets it, you can stay. You get the job done. You do things how they need to be done. Someone exceeds it is someone worth promoting. Now for us as leadership and in leadership and leading, we wanna always be on the lookout trying to identify people that exceed expectation and that do well and that take the extra mile and and go for that 11th rep when only 10 was asked for but let's not let's not leave that on our people and on the people that we lead way in our fields and only you guys can contextualize this and know where in your field it is where can you take a step further where can i exceed expectation where can people look at me and be like, wow, that's that's actually inspirational. That That's something I wanna work towards. Wow, if they feel so strongly about the church, if they feel so strongly about the company that they're willing to do that, I haven't seen other leaders do that. I haven't seen other people do that. Again, it paints a completely new picture for you, what you're building and how you're leading people. And it gives you influence and it gives you permission. It gives people a way to look at you differently and say, you know what, I will go and follow that leader wherever he's going, because it's someone who goes the extra mile. It's someone who breaks expectation. Number seven, as we begin to wrap up, the habit of fueling the fire. Um, number seven, the habit of fueling the fire. If you want to inspire other people, you need to inspire yourself first, fueling the fire of your leadership. You've probably realized it's easy to get excited about a new job, mission, project, but it's hard to stay passionate over a long period of time. Say amen behind your muted microphone. It's easy to get excited about something new, a new building, a new project, 
a new piece of gear, a new microphone, a new guitar, but it's hard to stay passionate over a long period of time. You've got to fuel your own fire. You've got to make sure that your passion levels are high, that your inspiration levels are high, that you're hungry and that you're enjoying what you're doing because there is nothing more attractive to onlookers buying new guitars. Yes, come on. There's nothing more attractive to people on the outside looking in and actually seeing people enjoy themselves, actually seeing people look like they're a part of something bigger than themselves, that it motivates them, that it inspires them, that it's something that they love doing. And it's about inspiration and motivation and understanding the difference. So we want to focus on inspiration, not, not, not motivation. Motivation comes from external motive where inspiration comes from within. So do you know what inspires you? Do you know the thing that, that, that really gets your heart going and makes you passionate and makes you hungry? And often we have to look back to understand what our inspiration is, where the, where the, where the flame comes from. Paul talks about fan into flame, the gift. Uh, that is, that's passion talk. That's talk of someone who is passionate, who's on fire, who's hungry for what God is doing. Let, let us as leaders, let us not become dull. Let us not become people that lack fire, that lack inspiration. Let people look at us and see someone who is, it's not about being the most gifted person in the room. It's not about someone who's, who's got it all together, but let people look at us and see, and see passion. Let them see zeal. Let them see someone who loves what they do and, and, and will really go the extra mile for that. And it's understanding we've got to fuel that. We've got to fuel that fire. A last thought here. If you do what you do out of motivation, you'll work until someone removes the external motivating factor. But if you do what you do out of inspiration, no one will be able to talk you out of your passion. If we have to motivate people every Sunday, um, and I'm, I'm using church, but please apply this to your different contexts as well. If you have to motivate somebody every Sunday to come on time, to come prepared, to believe God for something excellent, for something big, guys, I can't think of something more draining as a leader to have to just get up every Sunday and just come on guys, come on, you know, we got to do it. You know, you know, you know, but if somebody comes and says, Phil, I'm so ready for today. I'm expecting for God to move. I'm expecting for something to happen. Let's flip and move these speakers. Let's get this place set up and let's, let's help people encounter God today. That will rev my flipping engine up. And I'm just getting passionate thinking about it because there's, it, it's inspired, but we cannot expect our people to be flowing in inspiration, flowing in passion, if we as the leader cannot be inspiring in our own way. We're all geared differently. We're all wired differently. Our gifting is all different. It's not about being the flippant guy who stands and delivers, but, but we can be inspiring in our own way. And I think a lot of it comes down to passion. Are you passionate about what you do? Are you passionate about being a leader? Are you passionate about leading people? And that will rub off on other people. I hope that makes sense. The last habit is habit number eight. And then I don't think we're going to break up. I think we're just going to use this forum here. It's a small group and we can just share any kind of any thoughts here that have, that have popped up. Habit number eight, the habit of showing back up. The habit of showing back up. We all have goals and dreams and we also will all hit resistance and face opposition. When you stall out, not if, when you stall out, when you encounter staff problems, when you see little progress, when discouragement sets in, when you're tempted to quit, don't. What sets a great leader apart? According to Angela Duckworth in her book called Grit, great leaders aren't set apart by their intelligence, by their education, or by their talent. The world's top leaders are set apart by grit. It's an ugly word. Makes you think of the dirt. Makes you think of something that is not attractive. I would, I would much rather think that the best leaders are the smartest or the best looking or have the most talent. But... Studies show that they're set apart by grit. People with grit have the strength of character that refuses to quit. Leaders that achieve success over long periods of time are often the people who just didn't give up. Often the people who just didn't quit, who had a goal, who believed in a goal, who had the passion to carry them, and who understood that failure will come, stalling will come. Moments where we feel like we're the flipping worst leaders in the room will come. Are we going to give up? No. We're going to continue to trust God. We're going to continue to take steps of growth and develop. We're going to invest in ourselves. We're going to read books. We're going to listen to podcasts. We're going to welcome critique and feedback. Jeez, how can I be better? How can I understand things better? How can I be a better leader? And day by day, we're not going to give up 
We're going to continue to find a way to be passionate, find a way to lead people to the best of our ability. Craig Rochelle says it this way, when I commit, I don't quit. I'm a finisher. When I commit, I don't quit. I'm a finisher. When you commit to something, quitting is not an option. We're not going to quit. We're going to finish the task. We're going to touch the line. We're not going to cut the corner. We're going to finish the task that God has laid out in front of us. Sometimes the most important thing you can do is show back up, the habit of showing back up. Final thought here, Angela Duckworth again. Enthusiasm is common. Enthusiasm is common. Endurance is rare. Enthusiasm is common. Endurance is rare. Can we be leaders? Yes. Can we be the most enthusiastic? Of course, we'd love to be that. But can we be here in five years? Can we be in 10 years? Can we be leading in whatever capacity? Can we be loving people? Can we be helping people take steps in our companies, in our churches in 30, 40, 50 years time? Jeez, I think that's the ultimate goal of success, longevity. Enthusiasm is common, endurance is rare. I'm gonna run through these eight habits for us one more time. And then if we can do, uh, thanks Carl for all the resources that you're popping in there. And then, and then I'd love to just hear from each person, just the habit that you're like, that stuck out to me. That's something that I like. If you've taken no notes or have made no attention or taken no attention this whole time, here's your moment to shine. Listen to what I'm saying and pick one so you have something to say. Number one, the habit of no snooze, talking about morning rhythm, morning routine, why it's important to start with rhythm. If it's not early, Craig O'Shell says, doesn't have to be early, but it must be strong. Having morning routine, Second habit was the habit of pre-deciding, planning and preparing our days in a way where we won't be affected by decision fatigue because we understand the most important things and we've prioritized time for it. We've pre-decided what those things are. Number three, the habit of doing the hard right. Picking the thing and doing the thing that's right, not always what's easy because the temptation is gonna be to pick the thing that's easy and often it's the wrong way out. Greg Rochelle says, you'll never regret doing what's right, but you'll often regret doing what's easy, the hard right. Number four, the habit of you first leadership, understanding that the, the natural trajectory of leadership, being someone who speaks first, speaks last, the center of the room, often it can become about you. You need to fight that by making about people, loving and caring for people. If you don't like the people you lead, that's still your fault. That's still your responsibility. You can change that. You can bring in fresh culture. You can bring in fresh vision, work with the people that you've got, love and care about them from the heart. Um, number five, the habit of touching the line. Again, this is the idea that you don't stop when you're tired, you stop when you're done. Leadership is not about cutting corners. It's about touching the line at every opportunity. God has given you something to do. Don't cut corners. Do it to the best of your ability. Number six, the habit of one more rep. This is the idea of beating expectation. Um, we love people that, that go beyond, go beyond expectation, take initiative, move things forward. Those are the people we look to promote. As a leader, are we being those people as well? Are we people that are beating expectation, going over and above? And I believe that in itself is inspirational for people who want to follow. Craig Rochelle says, to exceed the expectations of others, raise the expectations for yourself. Number seven, second last, is the habit of fueling the fire, the idea of inspiration, the idea of passion, understanding what fuels you, what inspires you. Think back to what, to what started that flame in the first place and then not allowing yourself, listen, there's going to be dry spells and dry seasons, but don't allow yourself to be caught up leading and serving out of a dry place for too long. Seek help. Um, find things that, that, that fuel you. Remember, motivation is all about an external factor. When that external factor is taken away, the motivation goes away. Inspiration's from within. Are we inspired? Are we fueling that flame of inspiration? And then number eight, the habit of showing back up. Keyword, grit. Are we gritty? It's not about talent. It's not about looks. It's not about intelligence. Are we refusing to quit? Are we going to keep going? Again, enthusiasm is common. Endurance is rare. Just some habits and thoughts here. Hadley, I'm going to start with you because you're first on my screen. Um, any one of these habits, any one of these thoughts, any sentence stood out to you today you're going to walk away from today with? Um, and apply. Um, yeah, for me, I think the habit of feeling the fire is yeah. kind of stands out for me because, yeah, I think I think the point that you mentioned there that if we want to like inspire others to do something, then we ourselves need to kind of be inspired. And it is easy to, you know, we we are doing something for so long, and and like you say, you know, we just get to the place where it's it's dry. There's nothing there anymore, and I think oftentimes the thing that I lack 
or, 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 or need to get better at is to look back and be like, hey, like, why did why did I do this or start this in the first place? Why am I here? And sure. um, yeah, I think I think that that would that would help with, like you said, like just getting back to the source of why I started to do whatever it is that I'm doing. Um, just to, 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 to get that inspiration going again. And um, yeah, I think I think that's a, that's, a, that's a key thing for me. Very good. Thank you, Drew. Thank yeah. you very much. Says? Yeah, I think um, the morning routine has definitely challenged me because I used to have a really good morning routine, but I think over the last year, it's definitely gone downhill even while you were speaking <laughs> my yeah. dad like glared at me because he's like yeah like my morning routine needs to be better but I also think what Hadley's saying feeling the fire I think when you've been in doing something for so long it's easy almost to go into autopilot um and just do it and like without the inspiration without the passion because you you also know what you're doing or you know how to do it yeah. um reminding and I think it's also good like like Hadi said, to go back to the vision, to go back to the why. Like, mm. I'm obviously thinking of ministry. Like, what what is God's purpose in this? What is God's purpose for me in this? Um, and getting your inspiration from that. Um, mm. And not just having energy, but being inspired. Yeah. Um, like you said, not just being enthusiastic, but being inspired and being passionate um, and having that come from God's vision. Very good. Good, says. Thank you. Nadia? Um. Uh, for me, it's also fueling the fire because I strongly believe that you can only give what you have. Yeah. So if your fire is down, then this you're gonna be empty. So you, you yeah. need to you must stay full. Yeah. So that yeah. you can give. Yeah. Very good. Thanks, Nadia. Q. Um, <clears throat> there's there's two very similar. The number three have three habit of being the right and um, for you you the you first leadership mm. like the reason i probably need to work the most on that one is like especially if you're not comfortable with someone in your team i tend to avoid them yeah and, and, and like not really want to help them wow. but obviously you need to because you know, they're part of your team so and yeah. then you talk also in the background sort of maybe criticize what they do yes yeah. they do something silly you sort of criticize them. that's that's what you need to try and not do and more yeah. encourage them and guide them more instead of criticizing them, I guess. Very good. Yep, yep that's it. That's good. Thanks, Q. Very good, man. Geez, you, you, you're probably nailing all of us there with that one. Um, Sophia? Um, for me, it's the habit of doing the hard right. Um, mm. I really like that one because um, it's something I really try and like implement in my life group is that we always have to go back to what scripture says. You always have to do yeah. what's in with what the Bible says. And I think it falls, it's directly what that would, that, that is doing the hard right. Like it's not always the Bible's truth isn't always easy to hear. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to chew on sometimes. Um, but even that, like what you say that, um, that the best leaders ask what's right, not what's, what, um, what's like easy yeah. i think it's not always easy to say let me see what the bible says about this like is this in line with what god's truth is sure. so i really i really like that one excellent yeah i love your i love bringing it back to scripture as well i mean that's incredibly important and often you know sometimes the consequences of stuff is um it's so true and the scripture takes us there and we've got to acknowledge that as leaders and apply it it's very good evan um, okay, so for me, um, <laughs> as as was quite a few, um, and that's how I guess I, I love these 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 uh, talks that we have. Um, so the habit of snoozing, like I am terrible. I absolutely love my sleep. Um, <laughs> but for the for the last uh, almost two years now, my sleep's been taken oh. away because of the little one. So so I am up now, like at five o'clock or at half past five or half past four. Um, so, but, but I think we are, when she gets back into like, when she's in a routine and things that is definitely something I need to work on. Um, also touch the line. Don't stop when you're tired, stop mm -hmm. when you're done. Um, I think sometimes I can get so motivated in something and then like halfway through get tired and you just like, you know, but then I think like 
where number seven comes in again is that the habit of fueling the fire is that yeah. you then need to fuel that fire so that you can you can remember you know why you had that motivation why you wanted to get that done um but yeah like i said like just so many of those points but yeah i think those three really stood out for me excellent excellent thank you man samuel yeah, um i think the, the hard ride also stood out to me a lot um mm-hmm. i i, I me personally, I find it very easy to kind of go with what's kind of right. Um, mm. um, also, not sure what points was also like kind of ties in with kind of like doing the bare minimum. You know, like I, I find it difficult to sometimes have the the fire to go over and beyond mm. um, what's asked of me, especially like in you know I've been an intern for the past like work for the past year. Um, it's kind of difficult to because I don't want to like overstep and, and take that, but it, you know, I've kind of gotten used to that low level position. Um, yeah, and there was another point that I'm, that I'm not coming to mind right now, but yeah, no worries, that's good, man. Thank you. Um, Kaz, uh, you first leadership. I think it's something I have to remind myself often about is not to make it about me or not or to make sure that I'm not the one being too front and center and to kind of encourage others to as part of it. And it's part of my journey of teaching more than doing more mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. trying to be the hero all the time. Very good. Very good. Yeah, I think for me, um, as we land, Sorry, it, it's not 15 minutes early. Uh, for me, as we land, the habit of touching the line, um, finishing when something's done, um, I get very bored um, uh, quickly. And uh, I also want to see results quick. And uh, and when it doesn't, I lose interest and things tail off. Um, so for me, it's, it's a big, you know, it's a big challenge um, to 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 keep going and to and to once you've committed to something, just just get it done. No, no matter how pretty it needs to be or how pretty you think it's going. It's, you know, get it done, touch the line, keep going, finish the race and don't cut corners. I think for me, that would be the big one. Guys, thank you so much.